guys, it's Lee here from Anderson's TV. Today I'm joined by Chris from Alvarez Guitars and we are going to take a little look uh, at the history of this brand, some of the models that are in the range now, and, uh, and talk about why it is that Anderson's has decided to start stocking Alvarez in 2018. Chris, welcome to Guildford. Thank you. Um, you will notice from Chris's accent, he is from the northern wastes of uh, England somewhere. Uh, <laughs> Waste, wasteland. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about Alvarez, because it's a brand that I know of, and I know it has some heritage, but I, but I was surprised as I was <clears> reading <throat> about it, about just how much heritage it has. So it started in 1965 by... Um, a guy called Gene Cornboom, who owned St. Louis Music. And uh, he started with some classical guitars and he decided a Spanish name would be good. So, um, so there was never a Mr. Alvarez. Gene was a, an amazing um, guy for our industry. He's one of the sort of um, frontier guys who started importing from the East. And he met a builder called, a luthier called Kazuo Yairi in the late 60s. Yeah. Kazuo had a, a family factory. They'd been making um, violins since, I guess, the 30s or something. His father worked for uh, Suzuki. And they were building concert classical guitars. Gene met him and said, do you think you could build steel string guitars? Yeah. And they said, we learn together. So, so they started building you know, dreadnoughts and OMs in uh, the late 60s, and I believe the first... Alvarez Yairi guitars were imported in the States in 1970. And they did great because Japanese quality manufacturing mm. and their, their pride in detail and all that type of thing um, was you know, embraced by the market because in those days you know, there, was, there was no tailor. Mm -hmm. So you're down to um, Gibson and Martin. Martin and Gibson would yeah. have been the only two. And I suppose... Yeah, that was that 70s was when the, the Japanese really cottoned on to yeah. they could make a comparable guitar for half the price. Yeah. Uh, and lots of brands, I suppose, like Takamini and stuff like that kind of took off, didn't they? Absolutely. Mm. Uh, Takamini, you know, Ibanez certainly was probably the early 70s as well. So the market embraced it because it was great mm. uh, fit and finish. And um, as you said, it was it was more affordable. Mm -hmm. And the brand kind of exploded, especially in the 80s, it started getting um, really popular in the, in the States and we had some, some great artists who sort of embraced the brand as well. And, um, you know, so the brands worked with Grateful Dead for decades. It, we, we, you know, we have memorabilia and photographs of McCartney wow. and um, Santana, Crosby, Stills and Nash, um, Johnny Cash, all these people, Steve Brilliant. Winwood, who all played yeah. the Airy, but, um, so it's, so it's been around a long time in the States, and then really, we, um, under our management, we, we wanted to take it worldwide more about, um, probably about six years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, the high end is still made in Japan, so our res Yairi is still made in Japan. The, in there. That's the, that was the name, um, <clears throat> and my pronunciation's obviously wrong, but it's like Kai Yairi. Yai, Kazuo. Kazuo. Yeah. Oh, that's right, because it's, it's you see K the K, yeah, yeah. that's right. And I've seen and played one or two of those over the, you know, my life in and around guitars. And yeah. they're proper top end, aren't they? Like So the high end is still made in Japan, and then the more affordable instruments, we take a lot of our Lucia work, our Benchmade R&D, and we take that into the factory. Yeah. So there's kind of a DNA running through the whole line with sound and bracing and all that sort of stuff. Yeah.
so I, I guess um, you know if if we have a USP, you know, when we started this journey, really, obviously I had to go to management and um, give them a business plan of what we want to do. And the business plan was to to make the the uh, the best quality imported guitars in the states, mm -hmm. and the investment behind that. And of course, sometimes people look at the investment and think, "What? You know, is it? Yeah. That's that's a big commitment when you bring yeah. in specialists." And there's, we spend years in the factory, literally, and um, and it's not a, a front end investment. It, that's every year. So to me, there's no point doing R and D and then. You have a brand. The yeah. R and D has to be built into every budget for every year, yeah. every week, and that hopefully creates a culture within the, within the team. And I was very lucky because they agreed to that and they they trusted us. And obviously, a few years later, it's the reward and the, yeah. on that investment comes back. So when I look at brands that I love and understand, everything starts with with quality mm -hmm. and um, information and a little bit of obsessiveness. You know, when you have people here you've interviewed and they, yeah. especially about electric guitars, and they'll go about how many wounds are on a pickup yeah. and all that sort of so stuff. The, the devil is in the detail. Absolutely. Always. So, so for us, marketing and, and manufacturing are joined at the hip. So whatever we're doing mm -hmm. in the factory or in the, in the workshop in St. Louis or in Japan, you know, that comes through. So we have a true story to tell because mm -hmm. you've got to tell the truth these days. For sure. So we started... In Yairi, we started with developing bracing systems. Then um, we, you know, we we probably designed about eighteen and wheeled it down to something called FST two. This was about six years ago, which means forward shifted type two. Yeah. And we just kept the name that we'd worked with through development. And then we're happy with this. We we launch in the high end, and then we take that in into the more affordable price points. So we have bench made guitars, and then we have production made guitars, mm -hmm. and trying to keep that DNA is not so much about the application or, or somebody doing the job, it's about having the systems in place to make sure that happens every mm -hmm. day. And that's the hardest bit is the systems. Yeah. It's very difficult to teach a system to people. Yeah. It's easy to teach them how to, to uh, I don't know, to, to uh, it's fix the, the, the culture is the bit that takes the time to embed, isn't it? And the, and it the, is. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we went through our ups and downs in the early years and, and, and many things taught us how to get better. And um, and then we looked at finish, you know, finish is hard. It's the hardest thing on an acoustic guitar and guitars. And we really invested time in, in, into learning how, basically how to sand an instrument. So we spent certainly over a year going back and back and looking at different ways to sand, sanding our wood. Mm -hmm. So when you paint a guitar, obviously there's lots of grain in, 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 in tops. So you have to build, build the, um, the, the finish above the grain. And you can't just like slap on loads of paint because it runs and becomes thick and horrible. So it, there's many coats of paint on a guitar. Yeah. From 10 to 12 to 18. If you're using um, certain lacquer, it'll, it'll take more. So we spent very obsessively um, a long time using, looking at sanding processes and eventually we used DA sanders and you know, the hand sanders of the car industry mm -hmm. use it. And then we, we looked at what grits to use at every stage in the factory then we put a QC point at every stage. So if you look at our guitars, especially the dark wood guitars which show it more, I think one of the proudest things certainly from a project, it's completely clear. There is nothing in that finish whatsoever. So usually you get, on many guitars you'll get kind of a circular intercoat scratching in there. Right. Because you have to sand back every coat. So we spent a long time just making sure that our finish was as close to custom finish or an American finish, say. Um, and at this price point, when I generally when I pick guitars up off shelves, I don't see that sort of attention to detail. So things like this, I, I think, sort of um, sets us apart a little bit. And and the fact that you know, as I said, there's never a week or a day really that we're not yeah. doing some R and D. Well, let, let's um. So if somebody's looking to buy perhaps uh, one of the more affordable, well, yep. they're all affordable, but the most affordable Alvarez guitars. Yeah. Um, we're going to start with the AD 60. series. This yeah. is an AD 60. Yeah.
solid top. Yeah. Laminate mahogany back and sides by the looks of things. Mahogany neck. Um, is this using the forward shifted bracing yep. system? Oh, it yep. is as well. It so is, you yeah. should get a little bit more, perhaps a little bit more bass and a little yep. bit more volume out of it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, very much a traditional dreadnought, you know, 14th fret neck join. Uh, yeah. I like this, the detail on the on the bridge. I mean, it's, yeah. I don't know if there's a, a functional yeah. uh, benefit. There is as well, is yeah. there? Because I just think it looks pretty. So what's yeah. the functional benefit of the of the bridge? Design? So yeah, he designed this in the 80s, mm -hmm. but his is two piece. So this, his pins actually go on the top. This piece here isn't there. Right. So essentially his bridge actually doesn't need gluing it, but the, the tension would hold it on. But the reason the pins are so much lower than the saddle is to create this brake angle. Right. And he was a strong believer in string tension. Mm -hmm. And also we angle our headstock back by yeah. another degree. Usually people use 14 degrees, we use 15. Some yeah, area we use 16. So that gives us the tension that we like, so it doesn't mm -hmm. feel sloppy. Mm -hmm. With more tension, you, you generally get a, uh, you can create more energy. Yep. And with more energy, you can hopefully carve that to a, uh, to the tone that you you prefer yeah so inside here we have fst2 at this price point it's machined it's not cut by hand but it yeah. is finished by hand so you know if you if we cut the back of this guitar it's very tidy inside and, mm. and we made sure that whatever it looks like on the outside the inside is is very tidy as well um and the quality of the top you know so we buy you know we'll go and buy five thousand tops and what the factory do is pay a little extra, mm -hmm. and we go and hand select all the tops. So you have all of these thousands and thousands of yeah. say A grade, but within an A grade, there are many differences of quality. Yeah. So we pay a little bit extra and we're allowed to pick out of all the A's. Yeah. So, so this kind of AD Dreadnought series starts with a, a satin finish version of this. Um, this comes in around about the 260 mark. The, the gloss topped version, the 60 here, is uh, just over 300. And then there's another one above that with a walnut back and sides. Uh, again, various options to have this with a cutaway and an electro, um, you know, pickup fitted if you want it. So a dreadnought should, you know, that's the... Big sound. Big yeah. sounding mm -hmm. instrument. It's the kind of piano sounding guitar because you get all that low end. Yeah. But sometimes you, you can pick up a dreadnought and it doesn't have that. So... You know, if you have solid top and all the appointments that, that we do, it still means that there's knowledge needed to put all those appointments together and how you carve the bracing. Everything is about bracing. Yeah. Or most of it's about bracing. Yeah. And when you move bracing forward, we liked it for, for our guitars because it creates a larger soundboard area, so you get more vibration. But there's also lots of detail in the tone bars, are asymmetric, so we have one that releases the, the, the middle and and accentuates the, the, the treble and the bass. Yeah. And then the opposite tone bar inside peaks in the middle, so it tightens up the middle. And what we believe that does is give us a nice balance. So there's no string, that, the volume that bounces out. So for a 300 quid guitar, yeah. perfectly balanced, really responsive. You can feel yeah. it against your chest. Yeah. So that was the, the sort of, the, the relatively, I suppose, what just, uh, <laughs> you know, basic kind of performer yeah. sort of model. So, um, so this would be another Dreadnought. So, so that's an artist series. This yes. would be a masterwork. So we can do more artists. Oh. But, but, so this is I mean, all that solid. That is stunning, isn't it? So it's very traditional, it's our yeah. it's kind of bluegrass um, yeah. instrument. Solid two acid guitar, so you get lots of silking going on. Yeah. So when you see silking in an in instrument, it means it's been cut correctly, basically. Mm -hmm. So quarter sawn, you've heard of that mm -hmm. term, I'm sure. If you get it right on the quarter and you cut in through the medullary rays, so they're the cells of the, of the wood, you get all this lovely silking. And nice herringbone, um, we import this uh, from the States, so it's a very high quality pick guard. And when you get to all solid wood, 
you know, you start really getting that warmth and depth and all the notes are really round and just a sustain and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, even you can see actually on the detail of where the herringbone in, you can just see how much time has been taken to put this together. Uh, flip us the, let's have a look at the back of it. I mean, it's, again, all the timbers are cut nicely, aren't they? As you say, the finishing is Even beautiful. when you look at the neck, so our neck is, is, yeah. a, is a complex radius. So it, it, it goes from a very shallow V and it transitions through to a C. So we see and see these now. Mm -hmm. So now the, you know, the consistency is nailed on. Is nailed on. We, in the area, one guy spoke shaves every single one by hand, yeah. the, the old fashioned way. Yeah. So this is, um, you know, we, we, f we feel this feels better with a shallow V, that, you know, at the, at the low end, but as you transition up the, yeah. up the neck, it feels more better in a C shape. So we do things like that, which are very considered. But sound wise, especially for the Dread, the FST2 really. Um, <laughs> It's got that. Yeah. So within this artist series, um, where you've got the solid back and side solid, so have we got other guitars or you know what what else is in this? And shout if you want any of the guitars from over there. We can. We so can I would grab say them. well this uh, AGW here. So this is um, this is a new guitar that came out this year. Um, when I was talking about the finish, you can really mm -hmm. see this. It's yep. how clear that is. Um, with a solid hardwood top, so spruce is, is a softwood, mm -hmm. walnut, mahogany, etc. You get it's a more hardwood style instrument, so it's a different different sound. They're more focused. Spruce generally spreads with its with its projection. These are more um, focused sound. They're great for recording, live work, less overtones. So mm -hmm. you'll hear the spruce solid dreadnought, and you know you get all that tone that keeps going and right. change. So the fundamentals of the, of, of, the, of the tone. Also being a grand auditorium, the waist is a little tighter, so that yeah. accentuates the trebles. But on this, we do stuff like this um, very slim bevel. Mm -hmm. So again, this is one of our manufactured guitars. Fit and finish is fantastic. And then we, we, we do this, this type of thing just to show that we're we're able to do it at this price point and um, makes it a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more design. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the that's the concept, isn't it, with the armrest? I mean, I, I think it looks very pretty, but I guess the concept is when you sit like that, it does, it's yeah. less tiring on the arm than if it's got a, a more of a sort of a 90 yeah, degree exactly. sort of angle on it. Um, yeah, so you don't get fab. that red line on your arm. Yeah, it? exactly. <laughs> I noticed that um, you're teaming up with LR bags for, yep. is it all the electrics or some, just some of the electrics? So from the AD60 up, we, right. we use bags, yep. LR bags. And um, we've used two or three things mm -hmm. in the past. And we had a chance to work with Lloyd Bags and he's a great guy. And you know, he's certainly one of those obsessive sort of engineer types. Yep. It's a very, we use the element pickup with the stage pro system. It's a very clear sound. It's, um, it's a more higher end pickup than probably most mm -hmm. um, instruments at this price point. But we'd spent that much time on making the guitars. Yeah. It's like, are we going to stick a $10 system in this? Or, yeah. So. I mean, LR bags is, it's, it, you know, it's the, the, the top of the range LR bag systems and the top of the range Fishman systems, you know, they are premium, yeah. premium systems. Uh, so and I think and this ironically, system, not, it's not uncommon to see a system like that on a guitar that is 2,000 quid, you know. Yeah. So, so th this system is, I think, Dubai is about 200 bucks in the States, $180. Wow. And that, and that goes on our AD60. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's cool. So they worked with us to help us do that. And, Brilliant. Uh, and so consistent, you know. 
I mean, they just hardly so so all well. the electronics in all your guitars and under saddle piazzo or any of them got a blend system in there? Uh, no, we decided to use um, the elements. Some of the blues guitars and the smaller body guitars have their VTC system in, which has the um, so has, a, the... has a preamp in the end pin. Mm -hmm. um, but so the, it's still the, an under saddle pickup, just, correct? But, the, but no controls on the outside of the guitar. It's just like a preset. Correct. So it has it has a little output. console in the oh okay in the on the on the, yeah. in the sound hole. Fine, cool. But um, Staying in this more sort of contemporary looking uh, vein, yeah. um, I'm guessing something like this is relatively top of the range, is it? Um, not really. Not really? Well, get, yeah, getting Perhaps it up, should get, be. Getting up there. <laughs> I mean, it's... Um, this is an AG70WCE. So the W arrived last year when CITES. Of came. course. So lots of uh, so, rosewood not being used so much. And so we changed to Walnut. walnut. Which is, and we and, and led us to using walnut as tops as well, mm -hmm. and we love it. It's like it's, it's just a great wood to use. Uh, Gibson, Gibson are doing more and more yeah. um, walnut back and side guitars. Uh, Taylor more and more walnut back and side guitars. Yeah. For you, what did you? Uh, what what have you noticed the difference between working with with walnut and rosewood? Um, we tried a few things. Um, backs and sides was an easier choice. Mm -hmm. Bridge and fingerboard was a harder choice mm -hmm. because rose was just great, you know. It's like just it's just the right density and yeah. it's been there forever. And you know it lasts for two hundred years because there's guitars with it on for yeah. two hundred years old. So we tried everything. Absolutely tried all the tech woods, we tried oven coal, walnut, powerfero, Laurel, God knows what, it, what mm -hmm. whatever, anything without the word Dalberger in the species. Yes. So um, we settled on Palfero, which is a South American. Yeah. In every respect, genetically, it's it's kind of a, a, a rosewood. Yeah. But it's not a rosewood. Yeah. So you've added, do you stain yours? Because you've managed to get yours to look a little brown. Some of the Fender stuff with Palfero is quite red. Yeah. I don't know if, is that just a question of selecting the, the colour that you want or dyeing it a certain, you know, putting a dye in it? Or? So Palfero can be a, a little pinky, has mm. a sort of red hue to it. Um, we do a light oil, we use an oil with, with, a, with a dye in yeah. and we just... I, that's, that I think that's sensible. But I'm really interested actually tonally in what you found when you started using walnut instead of rosewood. Um, so rosewood is, if you look at the frequency of rosewood, it's a bit like a smile. Yeah. So you get lots of bass, lots of treble. Exactly. Nice natural mid cut. Yeah. yeah. So mahogany would, uh, sorry, uh, walnut slightly softer, uh, more towards mahogany sort mm -hmm. of tone. So you start flattening that curve out a little bit. Yeah. So you're not going to get as those really clear bases or yeah. powerful bases, but it's a great. You, you got more middle coming through basically. Yeah. So it's it's still a very attractive sound, mm -hmm. and I think it's better than. For us anyway, we found it better than oven coal. Yeah. And um, and then once we we matched it to the Palfero, it's amazing, especially the bridge, the bridge material. So we have the best thing about making lots of guitars. Like if you wanted to do R and D like that at the handmade level, it would take years. But mm -hmm. we made twenty guitars with different bridge on, bridges on in, in a month or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the difference in sound of what you use for the bridge is it was a real learning curve for yeah. us. Even the bridge pins. Even I mean, the bridge I, pins, yeah. Again, I've heard people yeah, dramatically right. change the yeah. sound of their acoustic guitar by putting yeah. different pins in yeah, it. It's absolutely. crazy, yeah. isn't it? So, all right, well, look. Oh, I, I must admit, every time the baritone comes out in any guitar range, everybody in the guitar you know, video team gets excited because they're just such great, fun instruments to they're play. Fun. And when you play it, you just seem to play something different to what you usually play. Exactly. So um, we made a Yairi baritone and we used to sell not many, maybe 20 to 30 a year. I thought, well, if we can sell 20 or 30 a year of a two and a half thousand dollar baritone, maybe we can sell double of a yeah. four or $500 baritone. And we brought this out and we spent a lot of time getting it right because there's a lot of string tension on this instrument with a, with a longer scale. Mm -hmm. So we beefed up the, the bracing a little bit and um, and then backed off so so you know we, we still wanted it to kind of resonate well. And we put it out there and we went out of the stock immediately.
a beautiful solid spruce top here. Solid Sitka again. We're a big Sitka fan yep. brand, so um, this has our shadow burst finish, which is an edge burst. Yeah. Again, very clear. Yeah. Very nicely done. Mahogany backs and sides, so the gloss uh, gloss top. Yeah. We call it a 50-50 backs and sides, so mm -hmm. it's um, it's a semi gloss. It's a 704 millimeter um, scale length, so it's about. Uh, 50 something mils more than a dread. So it's in between a dread note and, a, and an acoustic bass. Right, yeah. So tuned to B. So it's what, I'm, I'm on scale lengths, I'm not more used to seeing inches, but you're talking what, 26 and a half, something like that? 26, 26 and a half inch scale length? Yeah, something like that. 27. Approaching something, 27, yeah. you think, do you? Yeah. Well, look, the specs will be on our website. So this is, uh, we call it a Delta Double O. Yeah. And, um, you know, things, like I was saying before about our commitment, so we made the molds to this. Although this is similar to some very classic looking blues guitars, mm -hmm. it's, sli it's a slightly different shape. We didn't just want to lift. So we made the molds from scratch. The shape is, 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 is similar, but, but different. And we wanted to go for that pre-war bark, compressed blue sound, but a, a little mm. bit more open. So this is back shifted. Oh, back shifted, not yeah. for. I, do you know what? I've got to be honest with you and go, I'm not sure that I'm familiar with a back shifted bracing. Okay, so we call, I mean, it might be us, but we call, we have forward back and, and we have middle shifted. Yeah. And the reason you do that, so where that axis sits, obviously it, it's very close to the bridge and it's a very strong area. Mm -hmm. So if you push, for us anyway, if you push that axis forward, you're creating more weakness. Yeah, you're, you're allowing this part of the guitar to vibrate yeah. more, aren't you? And that's why I think the forward shifting gives that extra power and, yes. and uh, bassing, yeah. But for a blues instrument, you kind of want a compressed sort of bar. Oh, I tone. see. So you're just doing the opposite, really. You're sort of, you're, make, you're well, increasing the tension on the top here, are you? We are, but we took the bracing really light. Right. So we, we, we got our energy from the scalloping. Mm -hmm. But what we've learned over the years, if you remove something, you've got to put something back. Right. Otherwise, it'll come and bite you in the arse. So, you know, finding the balance of, again, strength and vibration. So we pushed this back. We got that kind of vintagey thing going on. And then we um, we, took, we took the bracing pretty yeah. light. I'm, I might be being dumb here. Have we got two identical guitars out by mistake? Or is uh, this actually different, this no. one here? Yeah. So that is... This, um, is, this is a... So that's a Blues 51. 51, yeah. So it's a slightly different shape. And if you spin that, it has an arch back. Ah. So um, this is slightly narrower. So that's the de right Delta Double Double O versus Blues Fifty One. Yeah, which is uh, named after guitars. Highway Fifty One, right. which is the road that took the early blues guys from yeah. the south to the north. So, so that's a more traditional kind of Gibson Double O, uh, yeah. sorry L Double O kind of vibe. Yeah. And then this is like an arch. I, again, I'm not. That's can't think of what. You know that I can't think of any of those older guitars that were arch tops, or is that? Is so it's that, an arch back. Flat oh, sorry, I meant yeah. arch back, yeah, not arch top. Yeah. Um, we're experimenting more now with, with arch backs because so you, pretty. It's so, it's quite narrow this guitar, mm. but arching it just gives you a little bit more air volume. Well, we'll, we'll definitely get the guys to. We'll definitely get the guys to have a little bit of a blues jam on those yeah. two. That's so for the sound stunning. of that, it's really open and responsive. Mm. And a lot of that becomes we've got a, a little bit more air volume going on here. And again, because we took the bracing down quite a lot. Wow. And this is walnut, right? Versus mahogany on Mahogany, that one? yeah. Yeah. You, once you get used to the, the grain and the coloration of walnut, it's that slightly lighter, uh, more beigey brown as opposed to the reddy brown. And the, and the grain's quite yeah. different on mahogany. Even the mold for the back, you know, like we looked at off the shelf molds and they all like these sort of 
very square sort of bumps. Mm -hmm. They weren't very attractive. So we made our own mould to, to press it as well. So I, I do like these. I mean, th these I always thought, these these are your late night sofa guitars, aren't they? Yeah. Just, you just sit there and you play all your Eric Clapton unplugged kind of riffs on it. And that's yeah. lovely. So last couple then. So I this mean, is definitely one of our best sellers, always has been. Yes. It's an AG75. It's a grand auditorium, has a cedar top walnut flux and sides these days. That shape, cutaway, electroacoustic, every that's a that's become for me the sort of the modern uh, go to shape for the guitar player that wants to do a bit of everything, isn't it? You know, yeah. I, mean, I think I think the dreadnought the there. dreadnought's probably got that heritage going back yeah. the best part of a hundred years, but in the last twenty or thirty years I think that shape has become yeah. generally considered as a kind of a bit more of a an all rounder. Yeah, um, it's it's a great shape. It's uh, as you said, it's a it's a great sort of jobbing guitar. It does everything, yeah. and um, people probably like its size. You know, sometimes the dreadnought's a little chunky for for some players. Yeah, but uh, and it's really attractive and it's very nicely balanced. And then if we go full Elvis Presley styley, yeah, I mean, the the you know it, the this is a a jumbo. It's a it's a fairly again well copied yes. kind of design. Yeah. It's never been you know it's so it's never been my favorite so i think i think once you go up to this size of guitar unless you're really going to give it some um it doesn't for, you know this isn't for me a sofa guitar you know this Correct. this is a this is a stand up bang out some big chords yeah. um make some noise we do a 12 string version of this oh, i bet well. that sounds great yeah. cuz i think that's the thing isn't it the bigger you go you know, yeah. if the top isn't really going, there's there's not much flex. So I guess with the twelve string, you've got double the yeah, it's double the thing kind of going. It's on. just a chime machine. Uh. Love to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments section below. Um, if you come to the store and you try one, uh, you know, maybe post your reaction on Facebook and tag us in that. Do a little video perhaps in the store of you trying them out. Um, yeah, and uh, anyway, Thanks, fingers Ed. crossed. It'll all go well. I'm sure Thank you guys for watching. Uh, well done for sticking to the end of this epically long Anderton's video <laughs> again. Uh, and uh, yes, stay tuned for whatever we do in the future. Subscribe, please. Thank you very much. See you later. Mm -hmm.